So good evening, brothers and sisters in the Dhamma. Sukihotu to all of you. <clears throat> Tonight we are giving, we've been given the topic on the power of mindfulness. <clears throat> Now this topic on the power of mindfulness, well, it can be a very specific topic or it can be a very wide topic. Huh? <clears throat> specific topic because in the way where the Buddha translate or when it's translated into English, the Buddha used also the word satibala, the power of mindfulness. And it's a very specific term that is to be developed by the mind. But sometimes people use the word power of mindfulness in a very general sense because they thought that whenever you have some degree of mindfulness, well, your mind gets more better than before. And we thought that that is the power of mindfulness. So, they are so much more deeper than what it means. Yeah. So, so here I'm going to discuss for tonight um, to give you an, an understanding of what mindfulness is. Then from this mindfulness, we're going to explore this mindfulness a little bit more deeper in a sense that you can see that there are, the potential of mindfulness can grow so much more deeper than what you think it, it is right now. Yeah. And it, when it grows so much more deeper, it brings about the, diff the, the, the different understanding, deep understanding on the Dhamma. Yeah. So, when we want to talk about mindfulness, it is good that we also must understand its characteristics. Not only just understand its characteristics, we also need to understand its difference from another state of mind. Because sometimes you may hear this mindfulness for a thousand times, but when it comes to the mind, you, you may regard mindfulness or you may regard something else as mindfulness, which is not mindfulness. Yeah. And that, that, can be, uh, that can be confusing and or not only confusing when you go into your mental development later on, it will also becomes problematic. Yeah? Becomes problematic. Oh. <clears throat> understanding of this mindfulness. Yeah? Understanding of this mindfulness, the part, the usually the translated as sati, S A T I. Yeah? Now this mindfulness. We hear it for many times. Yeah? We hear it many times. So what is this mindfulness, first of all? Uh, what is this mindfulness? Now, mindfulness here, there are two meanings, in part, especially in Pali. Yeah? In Pali, there are two meanings. First meaning is the sense of remembering. Just like you, you recollect memory and so on. The second mindfulness is here and now, the presentness of the mind. Yeah? Here and now, the presentness of the mind. In the mental development, in a state of mental development, you want to go for bhavana, mental development, through, uh, let's say, through samatha meditation or vipassana meditation, then we are looking in the second type of mindfulness. Yeah. The first type of mindfulness, generally, if you, you, if you talk about, if you can remember the past, you, recoll you recollect the past, so that too, in Pali sense, is also called sati. It's also called, uh, in English, it's memory. Yeah. So don't get confused this between these two. Although these two, they are also connected. Yeah? They are also connected. But for now, we look at it, these are 
two different aspects of mindfulness, two different aspects of sati. But in, when it comes to translation into English, mindfulness, when we translate it into mindfulness, it's usually used in the second aspect of it. We don't use mindfulness as memory. Usually we don't do that. But inherently, uh, deep also, in a deeper sense, well, mindfulness also connected to memory. Little, uh, short while we're going to discuss about that too. Eh? Uh, <clears throat> Now mindfulness here, when we say mindfulness, it means the present state of mind. But it's not every form of presentness of state of mind is mindfulness. You know? Not every orange color is the, the fruit of orange. But a fruit of orange is orange in color. You know? They are not the same. Yeah? Okay? So, so mindfulness is a, is a presentness of mind, but not all kinds of presentness is mindfulness. It's a very specific area which is only qualified as mindfulness. If you don't understand this part, between this, what is mindfulness and what is non-mindfulness, although they are all in a state of present, then sometimes we may totally have wrong understanding of what mindfulness is. Yeah. Uh, presentness here and now but it's, it comes also with another uh, another label which is uh, called uh, uh, heightened awareness or it is a clear awareness a clear presentness of here and now not just any form of here and now Say for example, when you are at home, you do a lot of things. You turn on the light, you turn on the switch, you open the door, you do this and you do that. Your mind is in the present. Right? Your mind is in the present. But can you say that you are mindful? Although you are present. Some of you nowadays uh, like to wear the t-shirt you know, here and now. Be present. Mindfulness. Everything. Here, you know, all kinds of everything now they have. But do you really know whether you, are you mindful? Are you having that quality of mindfulness or not? Because a lot of us, we really do not know. We just wear it, just want to support the center maybe. We wear it because you like that word mindfulness. Yeah. But the thing is that a lot of us mis misunderstood. They thought that when you're just having that presentness of mind, and that is already mindfulness. That is not mindfulness. Most of the time, most of the time, you are not in mindfulness. You are ignorantly present. <laughs> the word is ignorantly present, but you are not mindfully present. That's, what, how, that's how you live your life every day. That's how we live our life every day. Until we understood the quality of mindfulness, it raised the mind a few bars higher. Yeah? Yeah. So, so, so first of all, the, the, the type of presentness that you have in our everyday life, that already you put it aside. This is not already not mindfulness. Yeah? Yeah. If, if, um, if you get lost into your thoughts, if you get lost into your top breath, breath for example, if you get lost into your past, you recollect your past and, and you become totally uh, dwell inside into the past, or you become start the planning and, and, and you get drowned into the planning, those things are also not mindful. You, know, you are not mindful in, during, in that sense. But when, when we say when we're in the present, that also, as I said just now, we said we got to disregard the, the, the everyday type of mindfulness, that everyday type of awareness as also not mindful. So, but, but then, perhaps sometime in your life also, there are also mindfulness arises. There are also mindfulness arises, and all of you also have mindfulness arises. When it arises, it, it comes in as 
more alert type of mindfulness. Uh, sorry, more alert type of presentness. More alert in the sense that when you want to do something more carefully, you put more attention into it. When you put more attention into it, that you are doing something, then that mindfulness comes in. Yeah? You are heighten up the awareness. You are driving, for example. You are driving and then it's raining. Just now we came back from Cameron Highlands on the way, it's totally heavy rain. So the driver has to be heightened up its, uh, the awareness. And awareness much more clearer than before. And that it becomes mindfulness. But this type of mindfulness does not sustain because after that, it all disappears. And all disappears. And sometimes you too also have this type of mindfulness. For example, some, even some of you who are trying to do you know, the thread and the needle and you want to put through the, 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 the thread through the needle, you got to, your alertness has to be there. You've got to be fully alert to, of what is going on there. But most of the time, we don't use the word mindfulness. We use the word concentration. You've got to be focused. You've got to be aware. You've got to be focused. You've got to concentrate. Whereas, when the Buddha says concentration is another state of mind. That is when you have some degree of, mindful, uh, some degree of mindfulness. You're aware of what you're doing right there. So, you have that type of mindfulness. You, you, all of you have this potential to develop this mindfulness. It's just that the type of mindfulness that we have every day, it helps us to protect us in some situation where we, when the danger is there, your awareness is there, you protect yourself and then you overcome the danger, well and good, fine, yeah? wonderful. Yeah. But it cannot bring you into the deeper aspect of the Dhamma. That's the problem. Yeah? You, although you have that mindfulness, that type of mindfulness doesn't bring you into the deeper aspect of the Dhamma. Whereas the Buddha taught this mindfulness, it brings you into the Dhamma to understand the Dhamma and to make your life much even more happier, more clearer than before. So there must be a way for the mind to bring the mindfulness into a greater degree. Right? So here, it is where the Dharma and the teachers and the uh, practitioners begin to develop mindfulness through certain ways, certain technique to bring about that mindfulness. Not only bring about that mindfulness, but able to sustain the mindfulness for a longer period of time then with a longer period of time, the penetration into the understanding of the true nature as they are begins to be more clearer to the person who is, who is practicing. But that takes effort, that takes time. The, although the mindfulness you have right now, it cannot heat up, it, it cannot boil. You, know? you, you need more, even more training for the further development for the mindfulness to come. That is where, when the further development of mindfulness to come, that is where the power of mindfulness will lie. Yeah? is In the everyday type of mindfulness, you are not able to see the nature of its power of the mindfulness. Yeah? Now, <clears throat> mindfulness is here and now. You are aware of what is happening, you clearly know what is going on. You're fully alert of what is going on. Now, here again, as I said, you need also to differentiate. You need to differentiate between what is mindfulness and what is concentration. And the Buddha specifically used these two terms also. And it is good that for us to understand these two terms in order at least in the future when you want to do some meditation, I want to do some development, at least you know where to start. Yeah. But a lot of us, when you are not properly instructed, when you are not properly instructed, when you are in sufficient understanding about the mind, if you were to just to read the Dhamma, do you take the Dhamma books, you borrow from the Dhamma books, are you, nowadays, uh, not nowadays people like, uh, 
YouTube meditator, you know. There are, there, are, there are new trends, you know, there are YouTube meditators because I've been going over all over the world. And they say, then they, they, they write down their, their, you know, their forms, you know, when they come to this. And that. So where they, they get this, this meditation, they put their YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> so when they come in, they come in to the, you know, we ask them, so which, which teacher are you from the YouTube, you know, you, you learn this meditation, you know. So they say this and this, that and that. All right, fine, well and good, okay. But the problem is that when nobody guides them, uh, you see, when you, when you go on a YouTube thing, it's always one-way thing. It's just like when you read a book, it's also one-way thing. The book they say something, you got nowhere for you going to ask the questions and so on, you know. Now YouTube, you thought that you're going to put some comments there. You will take you some ages before that fellow is going to uh, reply to you. Uh? So nowadays, nowadays it becomes popular in this in this sense. Uh? But for me, for me before before I even uh, see how they meditate, I already know how the mind will incline. How the mind, what type of mind they were inclined just by you go on a meditation in this way, whether you just go on a meditation on with your books or just with the YouTube or, or some kind of CD or you listen to it and so on, you will get into, most of the time, you are going into concentration rather than mindfulness. And you really do not know and you, you, you thought that you thought that the more that you go into the concentration, you thought that the better you become. But finally, you get stuck somewhere. You get stuck somewhere with concentration when there's lack of mindfulness. Yeah? Development of the mind. Whenever all of you, you want to medit meditate. Uh, tonight you're supposed to have the metta, right? No metta. Right? Good. At least you got a talk. Yeah. Which is, if you have Metta, wonderful. But the thing is that when you want to start, even you want to start with Metta, you also need mindfulness. You cannot start Metta without mindfulness. Any form of wholesome mental development, it must have a foundation of mindfulness. Without that foundation of mindfulness, you will get into, get caught into the wrong aspect of metta, for example. And one of the wrong aspects of metta is the sensual desire. And that sensual desire, it mimics the quality of metta. Whereas the quality of metta is a wholesome one, but the, the, the twin evil brother is the sensual desire, or the lust. But it looks the same. But one is wholesome, the other one is unwholesome. Yeah. Now, here, the mindfulness here, when the mindfulness is there, it can able to aware whether the mind strays into the unwholesome path. It strays into the unwholesome path, it knows that, oh, the sensual desire is already coming up. Because the mindfulness is heightened up. Heightened up to know what is the state of mind is like. To know what is the state of mind, it heightened up to know this is going into some sensual desire, into lust, and then the mind drop this thing, pull it back to the metta. And it stays with the metta. Whereas a person without mindfulness, what happens is that when it goes into this metta, he concentrates. Now when it comes into concentration, it more like, it becomes like, if the mind becomes narrowed down, uh, it becomes like it looks through things like through like a sniper scope. Uh, it, it becomes to narrow down. When it becomes narrow down, it does not differentiate. It does not aware what is going on. Whatever is in front of it, it takes it, whether good or bad, whether wholesome or unwholesome. That is to say, uh, when the mind is totally concentrated on something. That is to say, even if concentrate on the lust, on the sensual desire, it doesn't differentiate whether that is wholesome or unwholesome. It will just take that sensual desire as an object of meditation. Then you don't really know why 
How come after some time, the mind is going into more and more desire and the metta is not coming up? So they get stuck there. And they get stuck there for a long period of time because the desire is behind it. And it feels good. And because lacking of that mindfulness, it cannot differentiate between whether this is metta or this is sensual desire. And for time and time, he will keep doing the same thing all over again. And the moment you sit down, you begin to look for that particular desire, that particular thing. Yeah. So mindfulness is very important. Yeah. Mindfulness, when it comes in into the mind, yeah, when, it, when, when, when it arises in the mind, it, it comes in like you are aware of something, but there is a peripheral awareness around it. Yeah. You know, there's a peripheral awareness around it. You're not, when the concentration comes in, it comes in as just narrow and it, does, it forgets about everything else. It, it forgets about everything else. Whereas mindfulness comes in and the more stronger the mindfulness becomes, the awareness of the sight, of the peripheral awareness, becomes even more clearer. And yet, when he does the meditation, he can able still concentrate or focus on the object that is going into, into it. Yeah. You can able to notice what is going on happening there and it also aware what is surrounding it at that moment of time. Where else? Eh? If you have just only concentration, the mind will just only concentrate on one thing and totally every other thing have, you do not know what is going on already. When you get caught into this way, some people thought that, well, it's okay. No, what's the problem with that? You know, what's the problem with that? After all, is, isn't it good that all your senses all become cut off here, cut off there, cut off everything? Isn't it wonderful? Isn't it calming? Isn't it, isn't it pleasant to be like that? Because for a lot of people, for a lot of people, this type of meditation, it feels good. And after all, all the whole day that you have gone into, into a lot of your work and a lot of your thinking, a lot of your uh, stress and so, so on, and then you want to sit down, you want to tune out everything else. And then you just want to stay there with your breath, perhaps, with your metta, perhaps, and then you want to everything out, cut, everything stop. You thought that that is good. In the beginning, it feels good. It feels good until some time uh, that you meditate, you know that you are not going anywhere else. It will just let you feel in this way only. So over the years, over time, over time you'll be just stuck inside there without understanding of further of the Dharma, without further understanding of the practice, and the mind will just stuck there for a long period of time. And we have seen this for, for many yogis. A yeah. few days ago, some people came to see Sayadaw, Nyaponika. He was talking and talking and talking. He says, nowadays I can teach 100,000 yogis. Oh, 100,000 yogis, he says, in China. Yeah. And then these, these people, uh, when I teach them, they can get all the calmness is there. All the pleasantness, they sit there and all the calmness, they can sit there for hours, become very calm, very peaceful, very nice. Before that, they will have this pain here, pain there, pain everywhere, but now I have all this calmness, all this pleasantness. Yeah? And you sit inside there, it feels so good. You thought that that is an achievement. Yeah? But if, if any, any monks will come and tell you this, uh, you also jump into the ship also. Yeah. You, will, you will do that because it is good, it is pleasant. It is, it is, it is so different from your everyday life. When your everyday life you have so much problems, you have a work problem, stress, work problem, family, financial, and so on and so forth. And you want some degree of calmness. So whenever any monks were to teach you this way, you're going to jump into it. Or any teacher is going to teach you in this way, you're going to jump into it. And when you jump into it, 
you're going to get, you get caught into it. You get caught into all this calmness. You get attached to it. And every time when you sit or when you want to, when you do your sitting, what do you look for? If you got the light, you sit down, what are you going to look for? Exactly. You're going to look for that again, again, and again, and again, and again, and again, and again, and again. And come to a time that when your mindfulness is no more there. When your mindfulness is no more there, your, your desire towards that calmness is always there. Because every sitting, you'll be looking for it already. That looking for it is another word for? Another word for desire. It's another word for craving. And the more that you do it, the more you want it. You forget about all the mindfulness. You don't care about all the mindfulness. You don't care about all these things anymore. You get to get caught into it. And you think that after, after you meditate, now you feel good. You think you're holy already. Yeah. Yeah. Three hours you can sit there. All the mind tune out everything. Whatever people come in, people go out, I don't hear. I only need that money. Sometimes they don't realize. A lot, I mean, a lot of times people don't realize it. They get caught into it. Even if you do anapana, let's say, uh, some of you may be doing the in-breath, out-breath. Even if you do in-breath, out-breath, uh, the calmness is all, must, you must always keep the calmness at the background. And you always must come back to the in-breath, out-breath again. The in-breath, out-breath is your main object. So too, uh, the metta. And you say that may you be free from harm and danger, let's say. You, know, you use this word, and may you be free from harm and danger. If you feel calm, if you feel good, then that calmness is supposed to be conducive for the metta. But without mindfulness, you can attach to the calmness instead of developing the metta. You're supposed to be come back, although it's calm at the background, you should come back to may I be free from harm and danger, or may you be free from harm and danger, and so on and so forth. That you are so, that the lines that you are going through. And if you stay with those lines, or if you stay with those breath, then you stay with the meditation object, and it will go further. And with the calmness, it becomes a very supportive role. And that is where the mindfulness comes in. The mindfulness between able to differentiate what is the right object and he able to stay with the right object and he put the wrong object aside. It's not to say wrong object. It's to say that it, you know which object for you to take up and you put the, the other, the calmness and the pleasantness at the background and that calmness becomes a condition for a further higher development to come. But if you get stuck with the calmness, then the whole mental development will stop without you realizing it. That's why mindfulness is a very important tool over here. Important tool for you to able to develop correctly. And, and, and along the, 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 the time that we are going to develop the mind, we develop one of this mindfulness, you need people to guide you. You need you need, you need instructors to guide you. You need proper teachers. You need competent teachers to guide you in order for you not to fall into the trap. And it's easy to fall into the trap because it's nice and it's pleasant. Yeah. Now, <clears throat> this mindfulness, yeah. although it's, it's the, Buddha, the Buddha's uh, instruction, teaching the Dhamma, is to bring, out, bring us to be free from this cycle of birth and rebirth. The whole development of mindfulness and other qualities also is finally for us to get out of this cycle of birth and rebirth or the Pali word is samsara. And because of this samsara here, when we can be reborn again, and we do not, we are, do not know where we are going to be reborn, because all the unwholesome and wholesome things that we have done in the past before, and they will ripen in the present and also in the future. And because of that, 
We are always get stuck in this cycle of birth and rebirth. The purpose of this development of this mindfulness is so that we can able to get out of this cycle of birth and rebirth. Yeah. But nevertheless, nowadays, nowadays people use this mindfulness for a different reasons. Uh, for different reasons. And, and the, the terrible thing is that, uh, although they may use the word mindfulness, as I said, sometimes they develop wrongly. But there are also teachers develop it rightly, which is wonderful. But the purpose is not for getting out of this cycle of birth and rebirth. Nowadays, mindfulness is used in so many areas, right? You've been reading it before. Nowadays, you have yoga mindfulness, you have uh, education mindfulness, you have, you know, even a CEO have, have personal trainer for them to train in mindfulness. You have uh, mindfulness connected to uh, pain relief, stress reduction, MBS, um, M MBSR, uh, mindfulness-based stress reduction. There's also mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, MBCT. And someone like, hey, you got the need cert for that also. Yeah. <laughs> you cannot just simply, even though you, you re do a few retreats here and there, you are not, still not called, you need to get a certification of whatever, you know. But, but the thing is that, the thing is that nowadays, this, this type of mindfulness thing, it, it, it becomes very popular. It becomes very popular in the sense that it helps people to overcome their problems or whatever problems that they have and it gives good results and they have studies and it shows there are good results but first of all let me remind you this mindfulness is not your go yo you know <laughs> doesn't mean that you have stress huh? so suddenly you want to use mindfulness huh, to overcome that stress and straight away you want to clear all your stress, it's not going to happen this way, you know. As I said, it's not your core, your, not your bum, you know. It's not, uh, <laughs> you need more training than that before it becomes it becomes effective, you know. If you have not done any mindfulness and you have some problem mentally or physically and something, and you want to use mindfulness immediately to overcome something, it's not going to happen overnight, all right. So it, it needs a lot of practice first before you can able to use it. But the thing is that this popular movement of mindfulness, yeah, when, we, when we develop this popular mindf development of mindfulness, it, it's, it dilute. It dilute or it, it dilute the teachings of the Buddha. And, and every time then they, they teach this mindfulness to the masses, to the people, the Buddha is not there. The Dhamma is not there. Money is there. Yeah. You know, you've got to talk how much first, you know. You're going to get, because you're going to go for a course and it costs you a few thousand, you know. It's not cheap, you know, actually. <laughs> so the money, you're talking about the money. You're talking about the money to go overcome that problem. And then the Buddha is out, the Dhamma is all out. So because of this, it becomes popular. And as I said, sometimes if Buddhist devotees, you don't understand these things, you also help to dilute the teachings of the Buddha. And, and you thought that, that that one is more important than what the teaching is. You know? Because it helped to solve your everyday problem. True, it helped to solve your everyday problem. It helped you solve one problem, there's, you got, still got a 10,000 problem behind you. You solve this problem, well and happy, you are good. But you think that next time it won't come back again? It may come up, it may come back in another problem. And then you want to try the mindfulness to solve it. Well and good. Then after that, you're gonna have another problem. Well and good, you solve it. But how long are you gonna finish it? Because your problem never ends. That's why we are in samsara. It never ends. Even you have every lifetime you learn about mindfulness, you're still in samsara because you can't get out of the whole thing. 
The nature of this mindfulness, the development of this mindfulness, is to finally to eradicate our greed, hatred, and delusion. Those are the fundamentals of all your problems. Every problem in your life, every problem you have seen in the past, some in your past life, in your present life, and in your future lives, is because of basically this greed, hatred, and delusion. We are when we use this mindfulness to overcome a lot of problem. Is you only clear the symptoms away, just like you know, some medicine that you go, ah, uh, they give you Panadol. What for? Clear some headache, but you got deeper, much more deeper problem. Yeah? So a lot of times we use this mindfulness as just to clear uh, some worldly problems that we have. But we don't consider that what the Buddha thought is that when we thought this mindfulness is to clear much more deeper problem, much more deeper problem that we have in order to finish off all your suffering. We don't consider that. We do, we, sometimes we don't want to consider that. Because why? Because we're homia. You know, homia, you know, life is too good. Life is nice. Life is pleasant. Yeah. Life is good. And that that we forget. We forget that we are in a state of actually in a state of suffering, or perhaps that we are rolling into more suffering more and more. With the disease, with the stress, with so on and so forth. We cannot run away from all these things and finally we end up in death. And finally we are going to be born again. And you roll back to the same thing all over again. Yeah. So we can't get out. So without the help of this mindfulness, you cannot start the mental development. And you cannot start the, this mental development, you cannot get out of this cycle of birth and rebirth. So therefore, mindfulness is the key over here. That's why it's important for us to understand what is this mindfulness. Huh? Uh, so, here, to go, go on a little bit more on this mindfulness. Uh, mindfulness has different facets, different aspects as you develop the mind further. It's the same mindfulness, but it exercises or it functions differently. Now, the Buddha used the word sati indriya. There are five faculties. One, the first faculty is sada indriya, uh, faith faculty. This is a mental faculty, not the, not the not the not our normal sense organ. Yeah? this is the mental faculty. The first one is faith, sada indriya. Second one is the effort, effort indriya or virya indriya. Third one is sati indriya, the mindfulness indriya. The mindfulness faculty. The fourth one is the concentration faculty or samadhi indriya. And the fifth one is wisdom, panya indriya, wisdom faculty. There are five. Okay? The Buddha also mentioned another five more. But the same quality, but use the word differently. Then it begins with sadda. Bala, the power of confidence. Then they have a second one, uh, Virya Bala, the power of effort, mental effort. Uh, the third one, Sat Sati Bala, the power of mindfulness. The fourth one, Samadhi Bala, the power of concentration. And then the fifth one, Panya Bala, the the power of wisdom. And here, when the Buddha used the word the sati here, it, it used the word differently. Same but different aspect of it. Yeah? As an indriya, what does a sati as an indriya differ from a sati as a power? Uh, an indriya here, it means the word indriya, when it comes into reading the, the suttas and if you are interested in reading these things, uh, indriya means it governs, it governing. Governing what? 
What does it govern? That means, what does faith governs? What does effort governs? What does sati governs? What area it control? Other words, your mind, uh, your mind when it works, it works like uh, something like in a factory or an office. You, know? yeah. you have multiple department, and multiple department do multiple jobs, different type of job, but for the sake of the company, right? So too, at a moment of time, while let's say while even you are listening here, there is a number of states of mind. It's governed, or it it works so that you can able to listen and process what I'm saying, just like every day else, everything else also. Uh, there are a number of things here. Uh, now, take for example, an indriya of virya. Effort, mental effort. What does mental effort do to the mind? What does it do to your mind? Here the mental effort, it governs the area of activeness of the mind. It keeps your mind active. If your mind lacking of that virya, that is to say that you are going to go into laziness. Mental laziness or dull uh, sleepy, dullness of the mind, then this is where your mind begins to lack of that mental effort. Huh? You, 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 you see that in your life. You, you see that in your everyday life. Even when you're, you're, you're alert, that is where your, this is what we call the virya is happening right now. It governs, it keeps the mind, it, 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 it makes the mind alert. Uh, it governs the area of alertness here. Uh, uh. Then, when you have sati, as an indriya, sati here, it governs the clear awareness. The clear awareness here, it also means uh, that it brings the mind close to the object. It brings the attention close to the object. Sometimes in the text, they use the word face to face, uh, confronting. Uh, during in our meditation, if you're those who are doing meditation here, if there's some degree of mindfulness is there, whether you are doing your metta or whether you're doing your vipassana or anapana, whenever you have uh, Mindfulness, you will see that uh, you will see that the mind goes near to an object. It goes near to an object. That is to say, if you take in in breath, out breath, you're not going to take the in breath, out breath far away. You're going to bring the in breath, out breath near to it. When you near to it, that is to say, mindfulness is there. That means, uh, here as an in indriya, the mind governs that area so that it brings the whole thing near to it and you watch it. The, the effort keeps everything active. If not, the mindfulness becomes lazy. The mindfulness also becomes not energetic. So the energy here, it provides for that mindfulness so that this mindfulness can do its job, so that to bring that, job, to bring that object near to it. Your everyday type of Mindful, uh, everyday type of awareness uh, that you have uh, is like the object is here, you are here. That far, you know. That's why you can't see what is going on. And in between is what we call ignorance. Uh. <laughs> you do not know what is happening. You just go on. And do that. So the mindfulness is to bring this thing close to it. Close to it. Then when it comes close to it, uh, that is where the panya the wisdom factor, it begins to differentiate what the nature of that object. And it begins to differentiate what is the object, you begin to gain deeper insight, a deeper understanding of things as they really are. That is to say, you begin to see anicca, impermanence. You begin to see non-self, what is really happening there. 
because the mind goes near to the object. If it's far away from the object, the wisdom factor cannot do its job to know what is happening there. Say, for example, you take the in-breath, out-breath. If you go far, far away from the in-breath, out-breath, you can't know what is happening with the breath here. So you've got to bring the breath near to it. Watch what is going on, whether it's long, whether it's short, whether it's fast, whether it's slow, whether it's warm, whether it's cold. Then you know what is happening. If you take this metta and you are not aware of the fully alert of what your words that you are going through, you do not feel what the metta is, you know, then you're going to do this metta very far away. A lot of you, uh, when you do metta, you know what happens inside your mind? You only repeat the words, uh, but your, uh, your heart goes on, you know. Nothing, you know. May I be well and happy, but I don't feel happy. Uh. <laughs> May you be well and happy, but I don't feel you. <laughs> that means empty inside. Huh? So th that is to say, um, when you want to do metta, you say, may I be free from harm and danger, let's say. Huh? Then when you feel it, when you say, may I be free from harm and danger, you've got to really feel it for yourself that I am free from harm and danger. Not just repeat the word like a parrot in the mind on it. And it's not going to be it's not going to work. It's not going to work for a long, long period of time. That's why a lot of time you do meta. How come so many years already? Uh, kang kang one, no no nothing one. Uh, I don't feel happy for other people. I don't feel happy for myself also. How come it doesn't work? Because you don't really feel for yourself. When you feel it for yourself, that means that is to say you're bringing the mind close to the meta. You feel it. Uh, so too, when you do uh, the, the, the rising, falling, you know, you pay attention to the rising, falling in vipassana, you be fully aware of the rising and falling. You don't go and do it far, far away. So too, like, when you watch the pain, especially in, in vipassana, you've got to go near to the pain, watch what the true nature of the feelings as they really are. That is the function of mindfulness, where it goes near to an object. So when it goes near to an object, that is to say the faculty of mindfulness. Mindfulness act as a faculty. Act as a faculty that it brings the mind close to the object. So that other things, other mental op other mental factors will able to do their job also. Yeah? Will able to do their job in that sense. So mindfulness as a faculty. Now, since you asked the, 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 the talk in power of mindfulness, then only we come to the power of mindfulness right now. And to understand why, how this power of mindfulness happened, you've got to understand what I've talked just now. Yeah? The things that I've mentioned about clearly aware what is going on, you're fully alert of what is going on. You, the, the, the nature of mindfulness is to bring the mind close to the object, now, this time, we look at it as a power of mindfulness, sati bala. And here, the, the nature of this sada bala, virya bala, sati bala, all this uh, uh, confidence, the, the effort, and so, the, the mindfulness, and so on, they act slightly differently. How do they act differently right now? Here, the word Power here, the word power, as in the the Buddha used the word bala here, it means it means it prevents the opposite from coming in. That is to say, uh, it prevents its unwholesome mental states from coming in. Uh, it's you know, you know, for example, here. We look at virya again, we look at effort again. Here in the indriya part, the virya acts or the effort acts as it gives the mind the activeness, right? Whereas when whereas the the bala here it prevents the laziness from coming in. There's two different things. You know? <laughs> because the first one does not deal with the unwholesomeness. It, it do its function. Whereas the second one, it deals with other unwholesomeness that's trying to come in. Say for example, sometimes you meditate. How come you get so sleepy? 
Why you get so sleepy? <laughs> then after sometimes some of you old age already lah, be ya lah, you know. That. Then you you blame everything else lah except your own mind. <laughs> you bring you blame everything else except your lacking of your practice. <laughs> <laughs> why does why does you sit just for a short while and the sleepiness comes in? Because here the virya here is hasn't turned into power yet. It's still very loose. You know, it's still very loose. Whereas, uh, for a meditator, for a very able to sustain meditator, what they can do uh, is that they can meditate for a period of time. And then whenever, whenever the, the, the drowsiness is going to come in, they're already aware of that drowsiness. They're already aware that the drowsiness is at the background, it's coming in. And then here, they prevent that drowsiness from coming in. Can you do that? <laughs> I cannot, exactly. Because you cannot do that because it hasn't turned into a power. Yet. And there are meditators who can able to do that, exactly able to do that. They can see this sleepiness is coming in and they prevent this sleepiness of coming in and they can continue the meditation. And not just only this sleepiness, but there are other things that are coming in also. For example, the mind is going to get distracted. You meditate here, how many times you might get distracted? <laughs> All the time. <laughs> you sit there for let's say half an hour. 25 minutes, maybe your mind is sleepy, go somewhere, drowsy, then give you 5 minutes <laughs> or 10 minutes at most. <laughs> yeah, but other than that, the mind totally gone. The mind gets distracted so easily. I hear when the, this distraction also is being prevented because here the samadhi faculty, uh, the, sorry, samadhi power or the concentration power becomes a power and it prevents this restlessness from even coming in. He knows the restlessness coming in. He knows that in the peripheral vision, they know that this is already on the background. It's going to come in. So it aware of it, prevent the whole thing, it doesn't come in. Can you do that? Again, you cannot. So again, when it comes into power of mindfulness, now this is interesting. Now the power of mindfulness here, it goes into what we call the opposite is called non-forgetfulness. And this is non-forgetfulness, it's not the word memory type of forgetfulness. Yeah. Here the forgetfulness uh, or non uh, there's another word for it. I totally forgot. What it means here is that it doesn't lose the object of its meditation. It doesn't lose, for example, he takes an in-breath, out-breath. He takes the, 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 the breath over here. Yeah? He aware of what is going on. And he aware of what is going on. But at the same time, because of the mindfulness, mindfulness aware of what is surrounding there. He aware of surrounding, that means uh, your senses, hearing, smelling, tasting, uh, usually is hearing, smelling, thoughts, they will be around at the peripher periphery of your object. So during this time, uh, when you pay attention to the object of your meditation, he's still aware of what is going on around it, but he doesn't forget to go, he doesn't forget and get lost into the peripheral object. He's aware of what is going on, but he still stays with the object of this practice. You know what I mean right now? That is to say, uh, even, uh, even uh, the external noise, uh, can be music, uh, you know. Sometimes for you, meditate, meditate, then the music comes in, what do you do? You sing along with it. <laughs> Mental karaoke with it. <laughs> if it's a, your favorite song, uh, you know. <laughs> if it comes your favorite song, you sit with it, then you, you have a, your mind will still start, start uh, you know, get distracted, and then you get, you get fall over it. Then where's your in-breath, out-breath? Here, when the mindfulness becomes as a power, although the sound is happening there, it doesn't go into the sound. It aware the sound is there, it aware the music is there, but it still stay on with the object. So too, so too, when the calmness is behind it, 
when the calmness and the pleasantness behind it, it's aware of that pleasantness, but it doesn't get fall into that pleasantness. It stays with the breath. It stays with the metta. It stays with the rising, falling. It stays with the vipassana objects, whatever that is, yet you are doing it at that moment of time. You see, the, here, what it means right now, now, although the surrounding it can be nice, can be pleasant, can be, can be, you want to drag the whole attention away, but because of the power of mindfulness is there, it stays with the object even though it's aware of what is happening around it. That is to say, it doesn't forget its object. You see what I mean now? So the thing that you in initially, where you forget about all your men, you get calmness, you get caught into the calmness, it because, as I said, the, mi the mindfulness is not there. So you need to have that mindfulness. When you have that mindfulness, you can able to be aware of what is going on and you do not get distracted or get forgetful or, or you, you get negligent. Non-negligent, that's the word, non-negligent. Non-heedlessness. Non-heedlessness. The, the, Buddha, the Buddha used to use the word appamada. Uh, heedless. Non-heedlessness, appamada. Yeah. So you don't forget about it, you don't be not heedful because, because if you get distracted over it, this is where your defilements are waiting. Lah. Your greed, your desire, your everything is just waiting around the periphery. So for example, you meditate, you know yourself. When you get caught into the thoughts, after that you get caught in the thought, you cry. Or if not crying, you get happy. Or you get happy, you totally forget about the thoughts for a long period of time. If, the, if, you, if you sit there, if you sit there, you hear something beautiful. And if you hear something beautiful, and then you get caught into it, that is where your desire just waiting for you. You see what I mean? So because of that mindfulness is there, it prevent, because of the power of mindfulness is there, it prevents the mind from going out into the peripheral object, although it awares of what is happening. The mind can know how to choose. So if you do not have this mindfulness, if you do not have this mindfulness, there will be comes a time uh, you will do not know what to choose. You will just go on attracting, get attracted to whatever it's there, whether it's wholesome or unwholesome. Because all the yogis, will, you have all these unwholesome mental states inside us. But if you do not know how to choose, if you do not know how to bring your mind back again to the original path, then we can get stuck in the wrong path for a long period of time. So this, this mindfulness thing, this power of mindfulness thing, when we, a, a yogi develops into that degree of that mindfulness, that mindfulness becomes very sustainable for a period of time. Here, the type of mindfulness that you have is just for a short while, then after that you let, really let go. That time when the mindfulness is there, it can last for a, a day or two, it can able to sustain. That's why the mind can go very far, very deep. Yeah? So, this is some on something on the mindfulness thing. Yeah? And, and hopefully that in the future, that whenever you go for um, mental development, hopefully consider this mindfulness. Because this mindfulness, if you have it, then other qualities of the mind will come in. Without this mindfulness, you're going to have a lot of problem. Okay? So we stop here. All right. <coughs> Anybody like to ask questions or uh, pass you the mic? <coughs> Just raise your hands and pass you.
to be there uh, besides meditation, is there any way to practice the mindfulness? Any more options to practice the mindfulness? Because since we know that it's so powerful, how are we going to master it? Okay. Honestly, the best way is mental development. I mean, that is to say, uh, meditation. And specifically, on the area of vipassana meditation. Specifically. Uh, you develop, because you really need to develop that mindfulness f before you need to be able to start with anything. But, this mindfulness can be developed also in the everyday life. It's not that it cannot be developed in the everyday life. But the thing is that, do you feel the need of it or not? Do you feel its power, its effectiveness of it or not? Because this mindfulness, if you develop it in everyday life, it's going to take you for a long time before you feel its effectiveness. You're going to feel... You see, we, we sometimes... Now, in the retreat, uh, yogis also go back after the retreat. They want to do something in their everyday life also. They cannot just be in the retreat all the time. They cannot be in the meditation all the time too, right? So they, they want to bring some degree of mindfulness into their everyday life. So it's, well, okay, you could do that. Not to say cannot, but you don't expect that it's going to be like when you are in the meditation time. Because while you are in the meditation, you are supposed to be doing it full time. If you do it part time, uh, then part time mi mindfulness. Uh, you know? <laughs> then you get it full time, then the mindfulness is more stronger. That, that is the fact. You, know? you put in the effort into it, it will come in, going to go stronger. Now, you are not going to ach achieve that like uh, in a retreat. You're gonna achieve, you're gonna, but you are going to be able to do something here in your everyday life. Now, why, what you can do in everyday life, uh, perhaps you find some time, maybe 10 minutes, 15 minutes or so, you do some degree of meditation. And hopefully you do the right meditation. Huh? We, are not, we are not looking into all this practice, technique and so on. Yeah? You can do some degree of meditation and if you do the right meditation, they'll be very good because if any form of right meditation, there will be some degree of mindfulness will be there. Even if you do metta correctly, there will always be some degree of metta, uh, mindfulness is there, although the foreground will be more of a metta. But nevertheless, what is important here is to do it every day. To do it every day. Every day in the sense that um, you meditate whether it's going to be 10 minutes or 5 minutes or 1 hour or half an hour, depending on how much time you have. But do some sitting every day or some of you who knows how to do some walking meditation every day, that'll be very good. And you can alternate it, you know, one day you want to do sitting, one day you want to do walking, or you just want to do sitting, or some, some days you just, just want to do walking, some days you just want, want to do walking and sitting. But what is important is that you do it every day. Don't worry about the time. See how much time perhaps on that day that you want to do, then do it. What is important here is to develop that habit. It's the habit. You know? It's not how much your meditation is. It's the habit. Habit to bring the mind back to the present. Whatever that you are doing, you leave it aside. Bring the mind back and especially bring the mind back to the body. Yeah? Bring the mind back to the in-breath, out-breath. Bring the mind back to the rising, falling. Bring the mind back to the whole body that is sitting down here. Then when you bring the mind back again and again, just doing it that, in that way, the mindfulness comes in. And I wouldn't say the mindfulness yet. Lah, but you got to, you know, this mindfulness uh, is it's like, it's like you try to polish something. Uh. You cannot polish sekali you polish. Uh. It can shining uh. You got to polish it again and again and again and again and again and slowly and slowly it gets shining. So to this mindfulness as well the same thing. You need to bring it the mind back again and again. Just just for that ten minutes, just for fifteen minutes, just for that half an hour, you bring the mind back to the present moment. Uh, in between you forget, never mind, you remember, 
you, you bring it back again, bring it back again. Then after that, you do whatever you want to do. This is the first thing. Yeah? Now the second thing you also need to do if you want to do some mindfulness is that to bring the mind in your everyday life when, when you are do not doing sitting or not doing walking, bring some degree of mindfulness into your everyday things, things that you are doing. Yeah. Say for example, you are in the office. You are in the office and then you are in the front of the computer. And in front of the computer, in front of a laptop, and then you are doing, and sometimes you can stuck there for three or four hours. Then time passes very fast. Yeah. And sometimes you get very headache, you get a lot of stress because of that. Now make it a habit if you can. If you after you do for a while, maybe about 45 minutes, an hour, just stop everything for a while. Just take a few deep breaths. Just stay there. Forget about it. Tune out, you know. Tune out all the work that you do. Then tune into the breath and tune into the rising and falling or tune into the body. Just sit there. Just be aware of, be, uh, be present over here. Be present here. Your mind is in the initially uh, is going to rebel, you know, it's going to want to go back to that work again. But you've got to make the effort to come back again, to make the effort come back. After some time, uh, what will happen to you is that, uh, what has happened to you is that you can able to tune out immediately that you want to drop that thing, it just drop and you just come inside here. It just, the whole mind can be fully aware of what is going on. That is after some time. Now. How, how long is after some time? That all depends on you. Now. Some people faster, some people slower. But the problem is that in between, when you don't see its effect, you say, after that, Jolai Jo Kim is Xiang, it's the same thing only. Uh, no effect, no change. Uh. So what do you do? You, you white flag already. Uh. <laughs> you give up already. Uh. That's it. You don't want to do. Because you don't see the effect there. Because as I said, the effect will take some time for it to change the mind. You can actually able to tune out. When you tune out all this work, uh, it means that uh, you, there will be a time that you can able to distress, you know. Just for that one minute, do it for that two minutes. Huh? If not, uh, sometimes we build up the stress, build up the tension inside us, and we cannot able to let it go because it keep on going and keep on building and we keep on thinking about it, it keep on fermenting inside there. One day also you can have a lot of problem. So here the mind can able to tune out. Just back again to the breath, back again to the rising, falling, back again to the presentness of the mind. It cools the whole mind down. It cools the whole mind down and it's going to be very helpful for you in the long run because you're going to have a lot of suffering. You're going to have a lot of suffering from throughout the many things that you're going to do in your life. So there is a way that using this mindfulness that you can able to help you to tune out. This is one. This is on mindfulness. But there are other ways also, there are other things also that you can do. You don't have to just do mindfulness, la, you know. You can, for example, you, you do metta over here again. Some, instead of you want to do mindfulness, instead of you, you do metta, la, yeah? you sit there, tune, come out from all, and then you sit there, may I be free from harm and danger. But you really feel it uh, again this time. Yeah? You feel that may I be free. Just do it for two or three minutes. Change of meditation object. Then when it help you in, to do that, a lot of times it helps the mindfulness, it helps the state of mind, it helps it overcome the stress, it makes the mind much more open and much more relaxed in the long run. But the thing is that, can we sustain that? If you don't see its effectiveness of it, very soon you will give up. The, because while we are in the retreat, when we are in the retreat, let's say you are in a two weeks retreat, you two weeks retreat, you are really trained. And if, if you, no, sorry to say, if you come to my retreat, uh, if you come in and play, play one, uh, you are out already. Uh. <laughs> we will make you train you 4 o'clock in the morning until 10 o'clock at night uh, to train that mindfulness, to really burn the mindfulness. Then when you see that mindfulness after two weeks, uh, see the power of that mindfulness, then you really appreciate that mindfulness. Then when you go back, then only you feel there's a sense of that mindfulness is can be part. It is wonderful thing. 
But if you don't feel that thing yet, and you expect to do it in everyday life, well, you don't see its effectiveness in a short run. Uh, so in other words, uh, you want to do something, usually you want to feel its effectiveness, the, the result of it. So that's why, if you don't go for a retreat, you don't really want to develop the mind more thoroughly, and you want to just stay here, not to say cannot, but it will take you some longer period of time. Okay? <clears throat> okay. retreats here and there. And the next retreat will be th a three months retreat. <laughs> I'm not gonna I'm not gonna turn you into enlightened, you know. <laughs> yeah, you know, it all depends on you. But this, the three months retreat here is is for those there are people who actually do three months retreat. In the retreat also we do also like there are people who do 10 days retreat or two weeks retreat or one month this one depending on the time that they have yeah. but here in this three months retreat there are for actually there are serious meditators over there people who have gone through some meditation and they want to do but if of course if you still want to do this retreat you have to come in from the first day onwards from the first day onwards i'll teach you the basic things uh, the the elementary of Meditation. Then you got to start from there on. If you don't start off from here, all this elementary uh, meditation, uh, then don't hope to come into a longer retreat. Because when you come into a longer retreat, somewhere in the middle, I'm not going to start off with all these beginners talks all over again. It's going to be a bit much more deeper than than this thing. Uh, yeah? It's going to be a bit more deeper. So if you want to do this retreat, it's good that you start off with something beginning. I think two years ago BGF conducted here for a five days retreat here. I've, I've done a five day over here. And also I've done a few five days retreat here and there. You know, a completely beginner's retreat. Completely beginner's retreat. And that will be very good for you to understand some degree of mindfulness. Yeah. So hopefully the next retreat will be in Kota Tinggi. <laughs> I move around, I move around. I don't have a base here. Wherever people invite me, I go, if I got the time. If I don't have the time, I shake leg. <laughs> Any other questions? If you want to know the other retreats coming up, you look into my blog. You type my name there in Google, you will usually will come up the first one. <clears throat> Maybe it's a personal question. Yeah, I'm just not answering. Uh, in the sense that uh, all the years of meditating, uh, what kind of Uh, what feeling? Magical feeling. <laughs> <laughs> you want to know what magical feeling and all that thing, huh? I tell, I'll tell you what I feel. I feel pain, pain, and more pain. <laughs> but that's what you think. That's where you. That's where you think. You see, you see, it's it's not. A, don't look about personal about me. You know? I'm gonna tell you what you're gonna experience, even before you start off with this 
this uh, mental development thing, especially on Vipassana, or you can talk about Samatha also the same thing. Yeah? When you come into this mental development, if you think of magical feelings and so on, that means behind your mind, you already crave for it already. You'll be looking for the wrong things already. Here the Buddha's teaching is not about all these type of things. Even this, whether it's, whether it's this uh, comfortable feeling, pleasant feelings, or whether it's a painful feelings. What happened to the mind is that if you develop it correctly, is that we begin to see the true nature of the feelings. Say for example, if in, in the case of feelings here, if you pay attention to the pain, then you say it's no fun because that is where when you see the pain, you understand the pain. This is your mind here and in between this is ignorance here. This is what I'm trying to say. And when a, a meditator sees a pain, he sees it differently. He still sees the pain, but it brings the mind towards the pain right now. And here the magic turns. The magic turns here, it begins to see the true nature of the pain and how the pain develops, how the pain changes, how it arises, it passes away. And with that, it sees the non-self aspect of the pain, the anatta aspect of the pain, for example. He sees the non-self aspect is that all this pain is not created by I. It's not somebody created it. It's due to condition. Understand its condition, cause and effect, cause and effect in so many ways. This pain arises. And this pain is not I. And because of this, sees this thing, this is what the magic of the Dharma is. The magic of the Dharma is not this, just sit there and you feel good and feel nice. And if you don't see the true nature of this pain as they really are, then you don't see the magic of the Dharma. It is truly because you feel not the, just the pain, but you see truly the true nature of the pain. Not only just the pleasant feelings, but you see the true nature of the pleasant feelings. You begin to see the feelings as something that is impermanent. It's not going to be last all the time. And you pay attention close to it, really pay attention close to it, with the development of the mind, you see that this feeling arising and passing away again and again is not going to be there all the time. The moment it disappears, the next one come up, come up, disappear, come up. That time, the whole attachment to the pleasant feelings becomes, it becomes, you become disenchanted. You become like, you are fully aware of the pleasant feelings, but you are not caught with the craving of the pleasant feelings. You begin to see the true nature of that pleasant feeling. And within these pleasant feelings, they are actually impermanent. And because of its change and so on, finally also when you see the true nature, it is also suffering in a more deeper sense. And this is the magic of the Dhamma. Not just sit there and feel good and feel nice. If you feel nice, feel good, you're going to get, for a long, long period of time, you're going to get caught into it. Okay? Okay, last question. <clears throat> Yes, you could visualize in the beginning part, but finally, it's also you slowly and slowly the visualization has to. You have to let go of that visualization because in the deeper aspect of meta, the deeper aspect of meta is only the feeling. 
and all the visualization and even the, the words also that you feel for may you be well and happy and so on those words also we need to drop it off also and only the feeling of metta alone but in the beginning part we use the visualization we use the words in order to arouse that mind to arouse that metta and so so it's good in a way but don't get caught into that visualization because that visualization can turn into many ways or no? <laughs> it can turn into because the mind uh, is very cunning it can you can you can switch and turn and then finally you're not forgetting your meta you're more interested in the visualization so just be careful for that yeah you know? uh, so 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 for some people that they, they are more they are, they are you know they are they are very particular of the words you know it must be exactly right phrase of the English present tense, past tense, or whatever tense they need going to be used must be properly mentioned. You know, they are very particular into it. So some people have a different, different um, inclination. So if you are visualizing type of person, make sure that when you do this meta, don't get caught into this visualization. This visualization is just to help you to arouse that feeling of the meta. The feeling of the metta is a goodwill type of feeling that you feel for yourself and you feel for others. That the type of wholesome, that you, you know, you're the type of goodwill. And the more the stronger the goodwill becomes, you can, you can actually know how, the nature of the metta. Yeah? So the visualization is a, is a tool. The, the, the words that we are using is also a tool to arouse the metta. But don't get caught on the tools that we are using. All right? Okay. So we finish here. All right. So we share merits. Huh? <clears throat> They'll follow after me. Idang me punyang. Nibanasa. Pachayo. Hold to. Hold to. May these merits, May these merits be, a condition be a condition for the realization, for the realization of Nibbana. Idang me silang asawa kaya wahang. Hold to. May my virtue be a condition. For the, for the eradication of all mental defilements. Imang no punya bagang sabha satanang dema. We share these merits with our departed ones, with all beings, and all the devas. Sape Sata Suki Hontu Anumodantu May all beings be happy May they rejoice in these merits Sadhu <coughs>